So we're in your barn, aka the, the Schmuseum. This is, this is very early days for this place, isn't it? Yes. You've only just got the place and started. Well, you can see, we'll go around to it. There's lots of boxes to unpack and things. And yeah, it's, it's been a long time in the works. This yeah. has been in my mind for probably years, yeah. what I wanted to do. Um, but finally, a couple of weeks, weeks ago, we got the keys, moved the cars in, and now we're starting to, to work out how it's going to evolve. This is not going to be a publicly accessible place, is it? No, it's, it's a private garage, all sorts of reasons, insurance, security, but also filming my own videos, yeah. and needing, needing the space. But it's an opportunity to be able to hopefully create a, a virtual tool online where yeah. it can be visited. Obviously, we've got a lot to do in terms of completing it first, yeah. both the building inside as well as putting everything up, making, making the displays, and the cars will constantly evolve. Um, but it's, it, it's this kind of idea, I guess, of a, of a man cave, of a private dream garage, and yeah. having all my toys and bits and pieces out around all of the cars, but yeah. everything's still very much operational. It's yeah. not, let's say, garage queen, nothing will ever move, everything looks pristine, yes. because all of the cars go out and get driven. They're on the button. Yeah, everything's ready. Um, GT4. Cayman, I mm -hmm. really like these. I think the colour, this colour is cool. Um, this is this is the only Porsche that you have. Isn't Taycan. It? Sorry, yes, you have got the Taycan. Electric. Only so got combustion engine Porsche. So that's right. It's the only piston Porsche you have. So I used to have the first generation GT4, the 981. Um, loved that car. Yeah. Ran it for a while, did lots of good miles with it. Then I got a 991.2, second generation GT3. Yeah. Um, which I did a lot of driving with, but never fully got to grips with. So the natural succession for me was to go back to a GT4. Yeah. 718 came in GT4. It starts life a little bit more muted because of OPFs and the changes, of course. But now, thanks to a JCR exhaust, it's down, it sounds the part. It does. This is really actually good. a wrap. This is an Inner Tech Midnight what? Purple, it's called. I was looking at it to see whether it was wrapped because I couldn't quite tell. The quality for a vinyl wrap is, in, is really good. It is really good and it looks awesome, factory gold wheels. It's the perfect balance if you want a car to drive on the roads. 400 odd horsepower, manual gearbox, yeah. small, easy to position, beautifully set up. This wins every time, even over a supercar. Really? So driving here in the UK, around the countryside, you can't get better than this. I've never owned a Porsche. It's on the list of things yeah. that I might need to own. But instead of 911s, you gravitate towards the, the AMG GT or the SLS before that. Indeed. Um, well, I, I had the, the first AMG GTR when it yeah. launched. Do you remember they did this fantastic beast of the green hell? That campaign? car was one of the most su biggest surprises for me. But the, way they, really... the way they marketed it, but also the way it drove as a car, yeah. it, it was a really, it was a game changer yeah. for Mercedes. Was... And, I, and I bought one blind. I ordered it when it was rumoured that that would be the Black Series. Yeah. So I put my name down. I, I said to the dealer, I'd like an AMG GTR. And they said, that doesn't exist yet. Well, that doesn't exist. What's that? And I was like, it's coming. Just wait. Just, just wait. Just wait. It's going to come along. Um, so I had the first AMG GTI. In one year, I did nearly 20,000 miles with it. Wow. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. Put new turbos on it, exhaust, went overkill, but, yeah. but a car that I really enjoyed driving. And it set a bit of a bug for me. Um, and I went on to purchase the GTR Pro when it came along, which was the limited edition, more focused version, but based around the same engine, 750 cars, different manually adjustable suspension setup as opposed to adaptive dampers. Um, and a car I've done a lot of track days with, a lot of Nürburgring laps with it, but it also had updated infotainment, you know, digital dashboard display. Yeah. Part of me now kind of prefers the analog displays. Oh, you know, really? Every car has a digital display. The, of course. You get that old school feel, but it just updated things a little bit. And then AMG went and released this as well, the Roadster. Again, 750 cars. <sighs> and I'm not going to try and pretend there's any justifiable reason for both other than just wanting to enjoy you just, both you're experiences. Into it. Yeah. And you know, I've done a whole load of track days with that. I had one recently at Donington Park. The Roadster I've had on a big trip across the continent already. And I want to do something cool in here. I have bought a set of bucket seats. The factory wouldn't supply it with bucket seats. Right. So I have bought a set that I need to get installed. They're very firm riding. You know, these are made for smooth German tarmac. Yeah. And you can feel that. They're big cars. They're very wide. They are. And you're sat right back on the on towards the rear axle. Um, but I do a lot of touring. I do a lot of long drives and I love that kind of front mid engine layout. It's always one of my favorites, whether it's the AMGs or the Ferraris yeah. or any car. When I jump in something with that setup, yeah. rear driven, front mid, it just, it's just me in a, in a nutshell, which is why I've developed this obsession to what we'll get to. Do you think that a lot of 911 owners 
would be more convinced by these if they actually tried them. I'm sure. Because I think I'm a lot sure. of 9-11 owners haven't actually experienced one. I think that happens a lot with cars that have existed in various different iterations over a long period. Yeah. You people build up this die-hard relationship with just that and they yeah. don't want to try anything else. They do what's, what's the worst modern car you've driven? The worst the, modern that car? That you can remember that you were like, that, oh, I just don't like that. I just don't think it's very good. Supercar-wise, yeah. normal, normal Lamborghini Hurricanes, the four-wheel drive Hurricanes, because the steering is dead. Yep. Steer, I don't like the front, the heavy weight on the front and the yeah. fakeness of it. Yeah. They fixed it with the rear-wheel drive and the STO, yeah. which I'll have one joining later in the year. But the four-wheel drive Hurricane, steering for me, that's why I love my McLaren so much, because this, they're, they're so good in terms of the feel. This is the car that you only got like 24 hours ago. Yeah, this is a special one. This is a very, very special car for me. Um, I suppose it's an odd one in the collection. It's the oldest car in the connection. It's a 2009 4.7 V8 Vantage Roadster. Yeah. But having picked it up yesterday for the second time, it's the very car that I bought back in 2010, which was the first Schmiemobile on my YouTube channel, the first car that ever had that name, but it was also Driving this in central London was the first time I ever spoke to camera on a YouTube video. Is it? Driving so in this car. No, I mean, it's far from one of the most expensive cars in the collection. I mean, it's barely worth more than the GR Yaris, and it's yeah. worth less than my Focus RS, to be honest. And even opening the door and hearing it prime, that noise just brings back all of those memories of the early days for me, because this opened so many doors to get to where everything I have done has led me, yeah. because it made it possible to... I suppose in many ways be taken seriously in yeah. the online space. When you have a lot of cars, and then we'll move on to the Gary Yaris. <laughs> the... When, when you have a lot of cars, logistically, it gets complicated, right? You can't be doing this on your own. You must have someone to help you. Like that needs a service or the yeah. a weird lights come on on that and I've got to get it sorted. And I, I kid you not. Tires. A, a collection uh, like this. Um, I'm at, I want to say 16 cars at the moment. It's a full-time job. And I, I've recently hired a, a friend who's joined the team to be the garage manager effectively to look after the cars in the garage. Because as you say, every car needs a service every year. Many cars have something else they need every year. Yeah. Some cars will go on winter tires for the winter. Yeah. Many things need to be prepped for different trips we go on. Let's talk about insurance. Yeah. How do you get insured on all of this? And what's your <laughs> annual insurance bill for cars? It must be pretty bloody hideous. It's, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. It's about one of those a year. Is it really? Yeah, it's that, it's that kind of ballpark. Um, but you've got to do it. You, you do have to do it. And you know, I have a very clear relationship with my insurance company for what I do. Yeah. Obviously every situation is different. Here, of course, we've installed all the security requirements that insurance company set and, and some more. But even in terms of the fact that I take cars to different events, the fact that I have numerous different people drive my cars, they're all insured for the purposes that I use them. Um, so I know that I pay a lot of money for that, that privilege, but yeah. it's vital. Do you want a hypercar? You obviously, you've, you've got friends with, with them and you've been out in them, things like the Chirons, the, the, the Koenigsegg Regueras of the world, yeah. you know. It's, I think very hard to appreciate, let's say from outside, that there's actually a very big financial gap between these cars and the likes of the Chiron and the Regera, because a highly specced Chiron is actually worth more than everything that's in this garage, yeah. <laughs> which is, is, is the first hurdle, let's yeah. say, and I'm not there, maybe, maybe in the future, you never know. But the second yeah. hurdle is it's actually very different what you can do with them, yeah. because of course, as I think pretty much anybody who purchases a car like that, there's probably some funding behind it, there's certainly insurance behind it. Mm -hmm. You can't just, because of the value of anything, if it happens, you can't just use the car in the way that you would normally use your car. Okay. You know, if you want to go to a track day, you probably need to get it signed off and make sure that you know, you're fully covered and it's very expensive to do so. If you want to have other people drive it, you probably have to run them through various tests to have them signed off that their driving is up to the standard to be able to drive that kind of car. Yeah. And it doesn't have the same freedom. So if you could buy a hypercar yeah. now, now, today, what, what would it I be? I know exactly what it would what be. What would it be and why? AMG one. Okay. Because effectively, I'm very much drawn to motorsport influence in road cars. And there's nothing closer to that than F an F1 engine, the most successful F1 engine of all time, and especially of the recent period yeah. in a road car. Yeah. I also find it fascinating in terms of technology, future direction, but my, my favorite cars 
that I don't own, the two, two that would be on this list are the Ferrari F50 and the Porsche Carrera GT. Both of them have engines that were developed for motorsport. So I seem to have this like yeah, yeah, <laughs> this yeah. natural draw. Go, go yeah, other end of other end of the spectrum. But did you order one of these before you drove one? No, the first one I drove was this out of the dealer. Was it? So funny story about this. Um, the, the allocation actually came through a friend who had ordered it um, as opposed to, to me directly. But I thought, you know, why not? Yeah. This is going to be, I had a Supra before. I had the yeah. new Supra. You did, and yeah. And I love my Focus RSs. Yeah. So this was so much up my street to try and, and, and to, get, to get a hold of it. I have to confess, at this stage, I've not completely gelled with it as much as I thought I would. Okay. I'm only a thousand miles in due to being away a lot and, and having some mods. And it's got a Miltec exhaust. It's got the Giacuzzo styling kit on the exterior. So it has a nice wing at the back. And yeah. I think it looks cool. And we obviously did the livery. Um, yeah, to, loving to, the, the livery light to match will we'll come and have a I, quick look I at it. I actually it. think to do this livery was part of me wanting to get the car. Really? In a way to bring back that childhood memories of the rallies in the 90s and the Castrol livery of, yeah. obviously on the, on the, the GR4 Celica. I love a hot hatch. I love a sports car. I love even my G-Wagon. We'll get to that. You know, different cars have different feelings and you can use them in different ways. Yeah. And you can chuck something like this down a country lane in a way that you can't a supercar. Of course. Actually, I was going to ask you, do you, when you come to sell a car, when you decide you're going to get mm -hmm. rid of one, do you sell it privately? A mixture. You know, quite often people are aware of my collection and I've talked in videos that it's not forever. Yeah. And I might have somebody who says, when you're ready to sell that. Give me a give me a bell and you know I will yeah. obviously if somebody's reached out because the last thing I want to do for obvious reasons is put up a private advert and give my phone number out there and I'm never going to sell And how do you vet time wasters if someone goes yeah. I, I know you're going to sell this soon can I be the one do to you, buy it? Do you know what when you receive even a direct message saying I'm looking to buy that car anybody legitimate is obviously immediately legitimate you don't have to think about it truth be told because I'm growing a collection I probably only sell one car for every, let's say, three I buy. Yeah, your, your so behavior's changed. Yeah so, yeah, so it's almost like I'm not rushing to sell the car. You yeah. know, often when you're, as I was a couple of years ago, if you want to buy the next car, you need to sell the old one first. Fortunately for me now, you know, it's, it's not so intrinsically linked. This one, Heritage, it's one of 50. This I'm keeping. Somebody okay. can make me a big offer in this and I'm not selling it. It's a okay. special car. This is a keeper. <laughs> They're only... I had a great fun time with my blue Focus RS, then the red, and, and then this one. And it's a very nice link and a story. And I love a car with a story. I love a reason, as, as you'll see from so many cars in the collection. And in fact, the Heritage Focus RS was introduced as a tribute to the 1968 Escort Mark I. So this came out in 2018, 50th anniversary, 50 cars, UK only, due to being the most successful market for the Mark III yeah. RSs. Yeah. Back in 1968, in the British Touring Car Championship, the winner was an Escort Mark I in the Allen Mann racing colours, the red and gold, which you're going to see on yeah. my Ford GT. Yeah. So this car has a tribute link to that, yeah. and, I, and I love that. And I also love that one brand makes supercar, hot hatch, and muscle car. And yeah, which is pretty rare. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you then, do have a Mustang over in Miami yeah, so or somewhere? In Miami, yeah. My Shelby GT500, which is an obnoxious beast with 760 horsepower and lights up the rear tires like nobody's business. Eventually, I'll import it here just because it'll be cool. Yeah. But it's yeah. an ironic thing. Carbon fiber wheels and a wing on a 2,000 kilo Mustang or something. One of the moments I thought really changed the perception of, you, of your channel was when you called out Hennessy. Not Hennessy, SSC. Sorry, SSC. When you call that SSC for that um, for that, that, yeah. that that speed record, that was and a stressful week. Yeah, but it was very interesting because it was it was quite unlike you, or people thought it was unlike you. Yeah, I I saw myself as being in quite a unique situation, of the information that I had about that world, yeah. about top speed runs, about tyres, about the ability for a car to go that fast, combined with also my understanding of video. And knowing what I was looking at, I edit videos for a living, right? So I had a pretty good idea of what I was watching and, and whether there could be anything suspicious about it. Knowing all of the drivers who drive these cars, as yourself, you know, I've filmed with Andy Wallace at Bugatti, who's driven at 304.77 miles an hour in the, the Chiron 300 plus. I know Ollie Webb, who was driving the SSC to Atara. I know the guys at Hennessy. So yeah. I was in this strange position of kind of knowing everybody involved, but also, 
a position with an audience. You know, I wasn't just, let's say, the Koenigsegg owners group on Facebook who were talking about these problems. The, these questions, let's say. Yeah, yeah. But obviously, from a very biased perspective, because yeah. if you're a fan of Koenigsegg and you're calling out the company that's just broken your record, you're going to champion. Yeah. Of yes, course. of course. So I sat down and I said, right, wait a second. You know, let's rewind back and what's going on here. And it was a, a, an irony on that day itself because I was actually at the Nurburgring, intending that day to go and drive what would have been my 100th lap uh, for a lap with my SLS Black Series. Right. Unfortunately, the weather was so bad the track was closed. So I was sitting in my hotel thinking, what do I do? Oh, you were looking for content. I was looking like... for a video. So wow. I started thinking, right, new record. Let's just talk about the record. Let's yeah. talk about you know, the, this, this incredible run and 331 miles an hour by a car. Let, let's, let's talk about it. And that was how I accidentally started stumbling into things that just didn't make sense. And I was, I was sitting there thinking, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of honesty, integrity, being open with everything. I was sitting there thinking, you know, and remember this comes from a Nürburgring background where there have been some questionable lap times in recent years yeah. by multiple companies, unfortunately. It was a case of, hold up, has the wool just been pulled over the whole world's eyes? And if yeah. so, who's going to talk about it? Or are we all just going to sit back and be like, yeah, that happened? <laughs> Because if we do all say, yeah, that happened, the next company has to go 331 plus to beat a speed that may or may not have happened. Yeah. That's jumped the game by 40 odd miles an hour from before, from the average or, or whichever way you want to look at it. There are so many different calculations. And all of a sudden, a driver who will probably be somebody I know has to go to an extreme risk to break a record that probably didn't ever happen. It was interesting to see how people suddenly saw you in a different light, I think. I was, you know, I think there were a lot of, a lot of people who had already made their mind up that there was no way somebody in the social media space could possibly be correct about something like this. Yeah. And that, that did upset me at the time because it was, it was this instant, oh, I'm just making up a story for likes because I would get lumped into the same group as everyone else, but I've never done anything like that, and I never would do anything like that. The elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, quite um, literally. The, now, I, I've got a question for you. When you spec a brand new car, which yeah. you do quite a lot, yeah. certainly more than me, um, do you ever go for a base model? Yeah, my M3 is quite base. Is it? My M3 competition is not here right now, a new one, because I knew it's not a long-term car. You know, I know I won't still have it in two or three years, so what's the point in taking the depreciation? Okay. This is fairly highly equipped, but I think there are only about three options you can equip on it anyway. Because, yeah, they come pretty... Yeah. Um, this is actually a black car. It's called Topaz Skin, this stuff. Oh, it's yes. It's peelable paint spray. I've seen it. It's yeah. really clever. So we actually did it in the same metallic blue with satin navy accents to match my Senna specification. Oh, that, see, I'm a bit colorblind. They are navy. I thought they were black. Yeah, so the, the idea yeah. was this was going to be the towing wagon for the Senna. Yeah. But it was on the very day that we collected this car from Topaz with this finished. Having driven there in the Senna, we convoyed away, and on the motorway, the Senna got hit and then disappeared for six months. Which is why behind you, <laughs> there are bits of Senna <laughs> we on can, the we floor, can which we'll, 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 we'll come into. So it was a little bit ironic. And then, of course, by the time the Senna came back, the world descended into lockdowns. So I never really got many opportunities to do that. <laughs> There's nothing else really like it. I fully accept that this is totally unnecessary, and this in particular, because it's got an exhaust and a tune and it's 730 horsepower and over a thousand newton meters so it's yeah. it's mental but when you're pulling a trailer you don't even know there's a trailer behind you so, so it's, it's quite a trailer with a car in it like a big trailer yeah but the you just driving the car it's this mix of comfort s-class style seats nice tech with a high up seating position and a car that feels good has a nice v8 yeah it, it's just a really nice car to drive honestly you don't have a range rover no, this is my lug everything in the back car. We're going to go over there now. There's another line of cars. <laughs> so yeah, I, I remember when you got this car, um, it still looks very cool. Uh, in your terms, you've had this a while. It's four and a half years old now. Yeah. I think that generation of Vantage, of course, linking back to the Roadster, was a very iconic era for Aston Martin. Yeah. This was really a pivotal car wasn't it, when the Vantage launched in saving the company at that era. Yeah, it was. And Master Martin have always had this up and down, but DB9 and this were some of the most beautiful cars that money could buy. Yeah. This is 
a car that's very confusing on paper because it's still based on that 2004 Vantage model. Yeah. Yet it has a carbon fiber body, a massive wing on the rear, and it's not like it's it's too heavy for that to really be particularly beneficial. It has a small amount of extra power. It's 446 instead of the first one that had 400 odd. So yeah. it hasn't even stepped up too far along the way. But this car does something very different when you're driving it. The combination of its parts just creates this incredible experience from the heavy clutch and steering to the way the gear shifter feels to the sound it makes from the titanium exhaust. There are only 150 of them. So this is, as well. a, it's, this is a keeper. This is a permanent keeper. This is a permanent keeper. It's obviously, sure. it's stuck with you for yeah, a good reason. I don't drive it a lot. Um, it's done 10,000 miles. So even by these standards, for it's one, one of the these, highest, this is quite high, yeah, probably. One yeah. of the highest mileages. And that's included going to Sardinia with it and some <laughs> Nürburgring laps and VMAX down the Autobahn, et cetera, et cetera. I like to drive everything, but it's a car that even if I only drive 500 miles a year from now, I don't mind. Like, I'm very happy to just look at it, enjoy it, and the memories of it, because I was actually in the spray booth when this body in white was painted, standing wow. there motionless so the robots didn't get set, like the um, um, alarm sensors didn't stop. When it reached the end of the production line, because I actually stayed nearby the factory for its three or four days when it went round oh, the factory at yeah. Gaiden. That's cool. I idea. was there every single day. So when it got to the last position ready to be started, they let me sit in the car to fire it up for the first time. Senna. Slightly different track weapon. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it still looks as mad now. It's still I, a completely bonkers looking machine, isn't it? I've always described the Senna as scientifically beautiful because you yes. can't stand here and say it's a pretty looking car because it isn't. There's yes. so much going on yeah. in terms of gurney flaps, the nose bridge that's a bit awkward, but helps with the clean air going through to the, the snorkel, the active aero that you have at the front, these strange proportions yeah. as well, because it has to meet road homologation. It can't have a wing that hangs out the back, which is clearly what they wanted it to do, but then it would fit outside, it would be outside the bodywork and that's a no go. But 800 horsepower, yeah. 800 kilos of downforce, and it only weighs 1200 kilos. Weapon. It, it's a serious, serious concoction for drama and performance. And when you're driving this on a racetrack, it's got, it, it, it's, it's actually quite easy to drive it very fast. Is it's it? It's got very skinny front tires, which helps. Okay. You know, you know it's, it's geared towards understeer. You feel when you're at the edge, small throttle fluctu fluctuations like on a, a full spec GT3 or GTE car have a serious impact and you've always got more ability to turn in than you think you do. And it means that you so can push So it's quite confidence in, in inspiring. It's confidence inspiring, but you do need to keep your wits about you because you are still driving a very powerful rear wheel drive car on Trofeo R's. Yeah. Which I can tell you, if you put your foot down, it's very happy to go sideways. Even if you just put traction in sport mode, it's still very happy to go sideways. And this is the most expensive car you've ever bought, isn't it? It's the most expensive car I've ever bought um, over the Ford GT. In terms of market value, they're probably quite similar because this has come down and that's gone up probably. But I l I've learned a lot from it. I've had it for two and a half years. And the incident, of course, was a big almost moment in recalculating for me because of the stress that was involved in it. Yeah. Sourcing parts, they're not just on a shelf. If you need a new body part for a center, it has to be made for the car. It takes ages. The cost of it all, yeah. any part is so excruciatingly expensive. You know, if you if you tapped the front parking onto a curb or a wall or something because you don't have complete ideas of how long it is and you damage the bonnet and the wing piece and the splitter maybe, you're probably a hundred thousand pounds in. Oh my word. And it changes what you can do with the car. Yeah. So I'm always conscious of only driving it when I specifically want to drive it and when I'm in the mindset to drive it. But I can tell you, doing laps of the Nürburgring in this, one of the best experiences I've ever had. <laughs> it's, what it's, down. it's made for that, right? yeah. that's what it's made for. It. Yeah, and it means, you know, somebody like me, and I've, I've done a fair few laps, I'm in triple digits of laps at the Nürburgring. I can get this round in the, uh, the good old BTG, Bridge to Gantry in sub seven, and have done a few times. And wow. It's, I mean, I'm sure in the right hands, it can do a full lap in six and a half or something. It's so fast. McLaren have never done any lap times with it. Is it, th this way. is faster than the GT? significantly faster than the GT. Okay. So amusingly, I actually collected the GT, yeah. got home, parked it in my garage, yeah. and the next morning I collected the Senna. Really, within 24 hours or one Yeah, that was a, that was a- uh, Your two most expensive purchases. That was a mad couple of days. Um, my bank guys were not happy with me. <laughs> it's, it's, no. it's funny because I had ordered this three and a half years before that, 
and I'd ordered that like one and a half years before and they came at exactly the same time. How bizarre. Coincidence. How bizarre. This is Did my... you, have you had the previous GT? No, I haven't. No. Um, I haven't at all. But this is, this is my favorite of my cars. Is for it? Sure. Yeah, whenever, whenever, and it's one of the most common questions. Everything about this, I love. Everything about it from the design. I think it's one of the best looking cars, modern era supercars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also love that the actual design links back to the older GTs, the 05 or the GT40, even things like this curved shape around the nose and yeah. the look of the cabin. I love this. This is story. amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, the, this buttress here with this sort of valley. Tiny, tiny teardrop cabin, three and a half litre V6 sitting behind you. A lot of people obviously weren't big fans of the V6 at first, but when you actually drive it and you listen to it, believe me, it's, I, I'm it's a big good. fan of that engine. I think it's one of Ford's best engines. Yeah, it's, um, it's a, it's, the only problem I have with it is it's not very economical. Isn't it? No, it's particularly bad, particularly bad. What, considering its displacement? Well, I, I mean, if you just looked at the basics, 656 PS, 675 PS, yeah. that will do significantly more miles per gallon in any circumstances than will this it? will. Yeah, I, I shouldn't be complaining about fuel, but it, it's something you still think about. Yeah, but only people like you that actually drive and own these sorts of cars yeah, you, will know. You know it. Yeah. This is a 15 to the gallon car, whatever it might be, and that's <laughs> a 20 get to the gallon car. Yeah, exactly. But, but the, the biggest thing for me is the story of this car. The fact that most modern cars are introduced just because a board wanted to sell more vehicles and make bigger profits for the company. Understandable, that's how the world works. But this goes beyond that, because as well as being that loss leading halo product, and Ford lost a lot of money on these, it links so directly back to their history. So the whole story in the 1960s with the GT40, when Ford wanted to buy Ferrari, Enzo said no, they went and made the GT40, and they won the 24 hours of Le Mans uh, for four years in a row mm. with the top three positions in 1966. In 2016, taking this and going to race it. And this is so close to the race car. The road car version, you can tell that they were made together, that they are the same thing, whereas just about any other road going track supercar now is not really linked to its race car sibling. In fact, the gold stripes came directly from a pot of paint that Alan Mann Racing gave me from the Heritage Archives. Oh, really? To send to Ford to have matched for the stripes on this car. So I, I like went that. the extra mile That's for cool. it. I actually asked them um, if I knew that Alan Mann Racing, having had such a history with Ford, that there was a strong chance they would get a new GT, and I actually asked them for their support to do it, uh, to, to make this livery, as opposed to just kind of jumping in blind and them saying, hey, <laughs> we were going to do that. Yeah, please don't do that. Um, yeah. But it, it's even more than that for me personally. You know, I have a big McLaren thing, as you know, I've, I've owned five McLarens in total to date. Bruce McLaren used to drive in red and gold with Alaman Racing. The, the list of drivers who raced in cars wearing this livery, it, it's pretty yeah. extensive. Yeah. You read it and you're like, Okay, I know all those names. Yeah. The wheels on this car are actually not the standard ones. Now, you could order the GT with its completely regular wheels, which I have boxed up at the back, or you could spec the carbon wheels, which actually give you a different hub, so they're not interchangeable. Right. But I heard down the grapevine that these were going to come um, from BBS, who actually make the Ford GT race cars wheels based on this design, the FIR as it's called, and they made a limited run set of these for the road car fitment which are actually as light as the carbon fiber wheel option. Wow. While being painted in Le Mans Grey and matching, of course, to the race car. Pretty car, Tim. The car I've owned for the longest. I like um, it. 500 of them. They made the 500 coupes and then they made the 500 spiders. This is now five years old. It's hard to believe that this came out five years it ago. It doesn't look five years old and I bloody love the color. The color was a one-off. It's a personal color. We really, made it. Yeah, I like it. With MSO. It was a really fun experience. They presented me, I, I said I wanted to do it purple. They presented me with a whole series of purple spray out cards. And you know, it was kind of, it's between these two. And then they went and made another derivative of it. And then they added in some metallic sparkle, which we actually did in blue in the same color as the Senna. Cause I knew at the time I had my, it was called code name P15. And I'd yeah. already put in my letter of intent for the P15. So I was in my head, I was thinking forwards of, if that car comes in two or three years, it'd be cool to have yeah. a link between the two of them. Um, so we Do you get that, manufacturers like asking you to buy one of their cars? Not in a, not so directly, but like going, would you, would you like a, do you want us to put your name down for the next not, thing? Not really, to be no. honest. Because you, you must lose some money on some of the cars that you sell. Yes, but you know, something like this, I think it's fair to say this is probably down £150,000 on what it cost me, which yeah. is terrifying. Like, it's horrible. But 
along the way, I've driven it nearly 20,000 miles. I've had so much fun with this car. Yeah. I'm not about to sell it, so arguably this number is irrelevant anyway, because yeah. if you wanted that first owner specking new car experience and collecting it with zero miles and know the full history, the only way to do that was to buy it new. So this is like fresh. This is, this is very fresh. It's only had one or two outings. It's basically a race car with a picnic table back here. Yeah. If you want your lunch. I mean, that's active, so you don't that want to drink on there because that'll flip forward or something. <laughs> but yeah, the AMG GT Black Series, um, as we said, my SLS Black Series is currently away. Yeah. Um, but I bought the SLS Black Series as one of my, one of my dream cars. It was always on there, up, up there on my short list. But when it came out back in 2013, I wasn't in a position to purchase a car of, of that value at the time. So I purchased one last year. I resprayed it, controversial move. Yeah. But they weren't really done in bespoke colors back then. They only had a very small palette of about five different colors. And I imported a left-hand drive car for, from Germany um, that had had a slightly interesting past to begin with, which obviously puts off collectors to begin with. But I wanted to buy the car in a way with a mentality of, I'm going to use that without worrying about the future because I'm keeping it. Okay. So I resprayed it. I did the Rentec R1 upgrade package, headers, back exhaust, little tune. I've I drove it in the first five months, 12,000 miles, just everywhere. That's a lot of miles. I've had it at 200 miles an hour. I've had it up for many laps of the Nürburgring, and my word, have I enjoyed it. I'm keeping it for sure. It's currently offered a, a garage where it's been waiting for a part that's been held up for months and months and months, thanks to all of these microchip shortages. But it should be back very soon. Obviously, part of the SLS Black Series inspiration to me was knowing that this would come that the yeah. GT Black Series would, would arrive and the idea of having the pair, a very different pair, because the SLS, I would say, is a very dynamic, sporty Grand Tourer, but yeah. it is still a Grand Tourer. This is race car. Okay. This was built to go to the Nürburgring and break the record, which it did. Yeah. On a slightly damp day at that. Um, it took the record from... I mean, look at it. Yeah. It looks so cross. It's, it's Doesn't it? mentally aggressive, even more so like this in the satin black. Yeah. Um, so this is not a wrap. This, this is, is paint, yeah, this, this is, is paint. paint, but this is where I'm going to be controversial again because I'm going to repaint it. <laughs> wow. Because again, I've gone into this car saying to myself, I'm keeping this. You know, I've had this AMG GT story with the SLS. I've been building up to this in my head and I really wanted to do it in a particularly lovely color that Mercedes AMG have done in recent years called Solar Beam. It's a bright pearlescent yellow, multi-layered yellow. Unfortunately, they decided to actually pull Solar Beam away from the entire product portfolio the month that they opened the order book for this. So you're going to paint this yellow? So this is going to be stripped down completely soon. Wow. I'll get some running in miles done, make sure it's mechanically sound. Yeah. And then strip it down. But you know, I'm going to done, come back in a year's time and this will have 10,000 miles plus on it. Fair play, that's so a ballsy move to basically buy me. a brand new car of this calibre and it's, strip it. And the, the, the immediate thing to jump to about that kind of idea is that you're destroying the value of the car, right? That's what a lot of your traditional collectors would say. But by the time I've changed the exhaust, because this sounds disappointing to say the least. Right. Exhaust change, probably flown it to the US, maybe done a rally of sorts like the Gumball 3000 or something with it. Yep. Had it at VMAX, had it around the Nürburgring, used it everywhere. It's never going to be that dream garage queen collector zero mileage car. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of EVs. In fact, that was, like, that was the car I was driving when I first met you albeit a Zoe, not a yes. Taycan. Porsche electric vehicles did not exist. Honestly, back then, I would never have thought that I might actually one day be daily driving an electric car. Yeah. Now, I plunged myself in at the deep end purchasing this full hog Taycan Turbo S. I was going to say, yeah. you've gone for... Absolute. Yeah. Like, I've never been a big Tesla guy. Enjoyed the drive, but never felt connected to them. When I drove one of these the first time, I was like, that, that, that's a Porsche. It's yeah. a Porsche first. It just happens to be electric. Yes, I know what you mean. Thankfully, I now have a charger, I've got a CTEC dual car charger prepared for the future installed here at the garage, which makes my life much, much easier, especially because it's on three phase electricity, 22 kilowatt. Very good. This doesn't have the onboard 22 kilowatt charger, annoyingly. Oh, doesn't it? No. So I didn't spec the car. I bought it off uh, the dealer forecourt, effectively. Okay. Um, so this only does 11 kilowatt. But even that is a big game changer because it means in a full day here at work or overnight, it yep. will be back to 100% from anything it was on and it makes it usable. I, am I right in thinking that if you hadn't got this, you were going to sell this, you were going to get it? I would have it. struggled to be able to keep this. I actually bought the car intending to get the garage at around Christmas. Ah. Lockdowns, etc., etc. So et six months ago? Yes. 
this is the go-to for a daily because it's so comfortable to drive. Yeah. It's a lovely car. It's, I, I liken the, the luxury end of the EV market very much to the Rolls-Royce-esque experience because it's quiet and it's effortless. Yeah. And this car in particular has a magnificent ride. The yeah. suspension is wonderful. It is, it's really Glides good. down any road. You're loaded with the tech side of things, the Inno Drive, the adaptive cruise and lane assist. You yeah. just lightly, you know, waft along and the car does everything for you. Uh, uh, thanks for, for the tour of your vehicles. Uh, you've pleasure. got 90% of them here. A couple on the way that you couple on the way haven't, that haven't been built yet or are being built, which is I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. Pleasure. I enjoyed it. It's good to see an EV in the in the collection. Definitely.